Hello. Um, so we'll talk about uh, Apollo today. It's a tool for doing collaborative manual annotation uh, across uh, for genome sequencing projects. So how do you click it for? Oh, there we go. Uh, Okay. <clears throat> okay. So first, let's start off the the definition we use for genome annotation. Uh, we tend to think about it split into two sides: structural annotation, features, uh, their type, where they're located, um, and functional annotations: what they do, um, what pathways they're involved in, what gene families they belong to. Um, how their sequence is convert, conserved over uh, time and across organisms. Um, so here's an example genome analysis workflow. Uh, you might start with an experimental design, grind up whatever critter or thing that you have, uh, create an assembly, annotate it, produce some type of output, uh, do an analysis, and do, you know, synthesize, rinse, repeat, do it again. Um, Galaxy is awesome at this, and I've seen a ton of different um, tools integrated into the Galaxy workflow, both for transferring data, but also doing these different analyses. What we're going to concentrate on today is the annotation aspect. Um, and so, and Apollo is the manual annotation tool. So, um, automated identification is not Perfect. So we have, again, like I say, we have a ton of different tools uh, for identifying uh, and annotating genes from raw data. So typically these go through a round of um, uh, finding ORFs, doing multiple rounds of gene prediction, uh, predicting function, uh, expression patterns, so on and so forth. The problem is if there's errors in the assembly or you have limited coverage, um, precise identification can be difficult and your scaffolds may not be assembled process, uh, uh, properly. So you can see on the example on the left here, uh, we have a green exon perfectly lined up. Any computer could look at that and identify it easily. Uh, on the right, the, the BAM reads aren't quite uh, lining up correctly, so you might need additional evidence or a human eye or you know something about that biology. So this is why we advocate using uh, manual annotation. So, uh, and this allows a human user to go in, pull in additional data, use their biological expertise, and their ex as well as their experience as a curator, to make those type of judgment calls. Um, of course, Paul is a tool for doing this type of manual annotation. It's an open source web-based editor. Um, it's real-time collaborative, so if you have a user in one part of the nation or one country, make a change, all the other users see this change instantly. Um, it's built on top of a REST API, uh, all the interface, um, which I'll get into later. And most importantly, it's built on top of the JBrowse genomic browser, which um, Eric Gao sitting there in the front, and so he'll be demoing that, but it's a really great uh, browser uh, for viewing genomic data. So um, I like to think about this in three parts, um, or the Apollo stack. First is the evidence. So um, when you create your automated annotations or collect other data, it comes into this section at the bottom, um, which is called the evidence section. So here we have some examples of transcripts, uh, BAM reads, bigwig files um, displayed here. There's a couple different themes. Here I'm showing the dark theme. I'll switch back to the light theme at different points. We can color the CDS frames. Um, and so this is what you use to uh, basically collect and review the data. Second part is the, I say, the right part. Um, this is where you you create your exported annotations. Uh, any any of your genomic elephants, uh, uh, sorry, elements, go up there. Uh, and I'll get back to the third part in a second here. And so to create an annotation, you there's a couple ways to do it. Um, one, you basically click on the evidence you want and drag it up into this yellow section up here. Uh, a nice feature of this is if you click on any of the elements, you can see instantly the lineup or which elements line up. Uh, the second way is you can just use a right click and choose the type of feature you want. I think the default here is an mRNA. Um, so once you have these in the written section, you can um, adjust this by uh, dragging the X onto the left or the right, in this case. Um, 
Uh, also, you can edit the uh, genomic reference sequence by, with insertions, deletions, or substitutions, and any of your annotations will automatically pick up those changes. Uh, another nice feature uh, with respect to ed doing structural changes is you can actually get a history of everything you've done for that particular element and go back and forth uh, relatively easily. Um, so just a few other features uh, when you're doing uh, structural and functional edits. Um, like once you've annotated, you may have to, you may discover later that the type is incorrect. So you can actually go through and change that type. You can undo your change of type. In most cases, um, there's a bunch of other structural um, things you can change. And in terms of functional data, you, we could, we have a very loose, um, you can add a lot of different types of metadata, including PubMed refs and uh, Go annotations. So this is the third part, this annotator panel on the side. Um, the reason for putting this in is when you're viewing genomic data uh, from left to right, you're focused in on that current view, and if you want to see other annotations that you've made, if something's in isoform very quickly, um, you have that ability to do that as well as drill into detail um, quickly without having to um, zoom in and zoom out all the time. Um, you can search for annotations across all of your scaffolds quickly. Um, you can link to whatever you are if you want to share a location with other users. Uh, and it's closable, so if you do want to concentrate just on the annotations that you're working with, you could do that pretty easily. So just going to cover, cover a couple of the other tabs uh, in this as well. So we can view scaffolds quickly, navigate through them, and of course the important part is you can export these out um, we, we can do that as GFF3 or FASTA, and I think we talked uh, earlier about Chato. And um, so if you had, for example, a triple uh, database, you could export and do a Chato export, and automatically that database would come up. Um, so to create uh, an actual organism or genome to edit, what you do is you go through um, and uh, basically take your GFF3 or FASTA or other raw data types, run it through JBrowse script and put that data in, into a directory and basically point to that directory and boom, you're up, you can annotate. If you want to make it publicly share, shareable so other people can look at your evidence, it's just a simple checkbox. Um, and I think the other thing that we commonly see is, and kind of the whole point of this tool is you rarely have one or two people editing uh, a, a gene, and so, and you typically will have multiple organisms as well. So you have just a, reg, as you would expect, uh, a rich way of um, managing permissions for users and a Unix-style uh, ability to add groups as well. So if you have a a uh, ant group and you add another ant, anyone in that group will, of course, automatically get permissions, so it saves time. So um, this is all architectured. It's a JVM application that mounts JBrowser on the left. Um, we use the Grails framework. Um, it's built on Spring Hibernate. It's a pretty well-established uh, framework by now. Um, all of this is built of the entire user interface. Um, it interacts with the backend using a combination of web sockets um, that wrap the REST API. And so the nice thing about this is all the functionality we use to build the product can automatically, uh, automatically has uh, access to the REST API. Um, so you can script against that. So there's many ways to do this, uh, to do integrations and extend uh, with Apollo, because I think the point of all these tools in Galaxy is if you don't have a means of uh, doing these integrations and extending things, it's kind of pointly. None of these tools exist and thrive in isolation. So um, we're going to concentrate on uh, West, uh, REST, REST web services here. Um, so we list all of these within each product. It actually has their own um, list of uh, web services. Um, <clears throat> and so it makes it easy to integrate within, web, uh, within workflows. I put putting, putting triple um, as a question mark, if it's, uh, but uh, we'll get into that in just a bit. So there's a, many different integrations, um, both with JBrowse, Apollo, uh, different versions of Apollo. Some of them uh, we're going to concentrate here on the Galaxy integration. So this is largely the work of Eric Rashi uh, from the Center for Phage technology at Texas A&M. So obviously you can use Apollo as a standalone server um, and 
you know, and integrate with Apollo that way. Uh, Galaxy has REST services. Apollo has REST services. Um, but the point here is, is we can keep all of your workflow within Galaxy. Um, we have a Docker Compose uh, script up that should work uh, relatively easily. And Eric wrote a, a set of web services that wrap, uh, or, or sorry, a tool, a Galaxy tool that wraps the Apollo web services. Um, and this is largely what's driving this. So <clears throat> there's a, basically it's built off of Docker Compose that combines these different uh, Docker images using uh, Galaxy Apollo Nginx and then wires them together. Um, the workflow in general looks something like this. You have um, automated annotations. Uh, you add them to JBrowse. And then from JBrowse, uh, Apollo, you add these to Apollo, uh, and then do your annotations, and then you bring that GFF3 fast to Chato um, back into the uh, database. We don't have a Chato exporter for Galaxy, but it's not a bad idea. Um, and hopefully there'll be a, I think there's work on a triple integration both in Galaxy, and we just heard of a great one outside of Galaxy. You don't have to use triple, that's not a bad idea. Um, so here's the first step. This is the JBrowse interface. Um, so I show the reference sequences up there on top. Um, the GFF3 we have here, but it works with BAM, BigWig, um, uh, several other data types as well. Um, Eric added some nice integrations as well for auto-generating uh, SNP data. So once you have that imported, you can view that uh, and uh, the nice, really nice thing about, Apollo, or about this Galaxy integration we'll see in a minute is once you have all of these back, you can, you can flip back from your JBrowse to your Apollo view relatively easily, which is something I didn't anticipate being uh, neat, but I think I, I've heard more and more users wanting to be able to do that, so I think that's a really cool option. Um, so once you have that JBrowse data, you can add it or create an organism based on that. Excuse me. Um, so pretty straightforward, not much, too much doing. And so once you have that built in there, you click on the view, then you can annotate. Um, it's connecting over a, since it's Docker, it's actually a separate server running off of Docker. So you can actually connect to Apollo directly. Um, if you do use this, I would get rid of the left-hand panel. It tends to too many iframes, and so it doesn't work quite right. But you just get rid of that, and it works quite nicely. You can create annotations. Um, and then once you have those created, you can, of course, export it directly from Apollo, and you can get those data locally. But, I mean, the cool thing about working with Galaxy is you can just export them directly back into the workflow, and there you have your GFF3 and FASTA, and then you can actually create additional evidence using that. So it's, it's pretty slick. So, um, in summary, uh, you should use Apollo. If you are doing annotation, um, you should use all the awesome annotation tools here at Galaxy, but then use Apollo to do that final manual annotation step, and we have multiple ways to integrate that. Um, and thanks to Eric, we have this great integration with Galaxy and Docker using the web services we provided. Um, so I want to talk uh, briefly about what we are doing in the future. Uh, so uh, phenotype annotation, we have a way to do that now, but that's one of the things we're adding. Um, the ability to annotate variants, I've seen so many cool projects um, creating uh, SNPs uh, and, and other variant data, and uh, it just pains me not to be able to annotate that yet, but that is on our short list of things that, that are coming out. Um, and coordinate transform. So here's a few examples. Um, if you have a fragmented scaffold, or long introns, uh, I guess there are two different use cases. One, you should be able to collapse introns if they're you know, several hundred, tens of thousand base pairs long, or even uh, a few hundred, so you're just looking at that region in space and your evidence scales for that. So it makes annotation significantly easier. Um, the other piece is the ability to bring um, scaffold regions together. So if a scaffold is artificially broken up, you can bring those together, uh, create a gene or other feature type that, that scales across these, um, and so it should be useful. So anyway, um, I want to thank uh, the Apollo team, uh, Monica Minos-Torres, uh, our collaborators, Deepak Boonin, Colin Deesh, my PI, uh, Susie Lewis here, um, and of course Eric Rashi uh, at 
from Texas A&M, and uh, Jay Browse, uh, or Jay Browse developer, uh, Eric Gao. So, if you have any questions. <laughs> okay, so we have one from Crystal Thomas. Um, does Apollo support non-model organisms that would have species-specific genomic features? I, I caught the first, what was the second part? Um, model organisms, non-model organisms that would have species-specific genomic features. Species-specific genomic features. Um, we can add, I mean, we definitely support non-model organisms. We have many of them. That's why I think it's one of our focuses uh, over the years. Um, we, we can add additional feature types, um, and we also support non-standard code as well. That answers the question. Okay, good. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, I'll, I'll throw out one question. So uh, it's a very nice tool. Uh, so how do you identify, does Apollo identify the regions with questionable annotations or is this largely just uh, people manually identify the regions that need to be edited or is there some automated pathway that helps to identify those that are questionable? Um, I think it's largely, uh, I think it's largely that people identify their own uh, regions, um, but that's a great idea for a tool. I don't know, I don't think we have any additional, <laughs> no, no, I, only if you have something to say. Um, I, I think typically the, what I've seen is that people identify their own, but I, I... Yeah, usually that comes into play when you've gotten a new assembly trying to lift over the annotations from the previous, or you have a new set of transcriptome data and you want to see where the differences are. There are some utilities um, that look for, you know, altered exon boundaries and things like that. Um, we haven't, in the old Apollo we did, we haven't really done it in this one yet, where you can, like, basically have a short list of here's all the things you better check out from the previous version to this one, either based on a new assembly or new uh, transcript data. Okay, thank you, Nathan. <laughs>